Well, as promised, I am repodcasting my second lecture on elasticity. I'm going to try very hard not to record any more YouTube podcasts after midnight. It's after my bedtime. At any rate, price discrimination is not a topic that was covered in either your textbook or the one I used when I taught this course. But it's one of those economic phenomena we actually encounter all the time in our daily lives as consumers, and it is all about elasticity. That's why I included a question about price discrimination in your most recent quiz for extra credit and why I'm going to talk about it now. So let's begin with a bank ad. Okay, this is a funny video about customers being treated differently, but it is actually not an especially good example of price discrimination. Why not? Well, the answer is that there's no evidence and no real reason to assume that these two little girls have significantly different elasticities of demand for ponies, or that the bank was trying to exploit uh, to make money by exploiting differences between the two girls. Price discrimination is all about producers taking advantage of identifiably and predictably different elasticities to maximize total revenue and profit, which you remember is not the same thing as total revenue. So here's a better example. Let's assume that the woman on the left, as you look at the photo, is a voice performance major at the U. She's pretty much living on ramen noodles. She shares an apartment with five other young women to save money, but she hopes to become an opera singer. And no surprise, she really loves opera. Going to the opera brings her many utils. Now, when I Googled for photos of rich opera lovers, the woman on the right showed up. Uh, apparently, she's someone named Courtney Love, uh, a rocker who earns a lot of money and inherited mucho millions from another rocker, her dead husband, uh, Kurt Cobain. She was photographed at an opening night gala at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. So she, too, either gets big time utils from watching an opera or she gets big time utils from getting her photograph tweeted umpteen times. So. How does the Met get Courtney Love to dish out some of her oodles of cash for opera tickets and still lure our poverty-stricken student to the opera? One answer is that the student gets to sit so high in the balcony that she's likely to get nosebleeds. But the Met is also trying to take advantage of two very different elasticities of demand. The Met can sell tickets to the rich for very large sums and then fill remaining seats by selling discount tickets what would you guess is the marginal cost of one additional person in the audience for an opera? That's not very high. Uh, and by the way, the total cost and average cost of producing an opera are very high. We'll get there. So what potential problem might price discriminators face? Why might this strategy not work? Suppose our starving student decides that the marginal utility per dollar of a night at the opera, even at her discounted price, is less than the marginal utility per dollar of a square meal. Since she's out to maximize her marginal utility per dollar, aren't we all? She would be better off selling her ticket to someone with a higher uh, utility. Anyone who isn't in the discount group would be better off buying that ticket from her for a lower price than he or she would have to pay. So how can the opera avoid this utility maximizing behavior by consumers? It can make her show uh, her student ID at the ticket window. You saw this definition and these graphs in my last lecture, although I didn't bother to label them good A and good B. So now that I have, which one is elastic, good A or good B? I hope and trust you weren't fooled by my cropping and then reversing the images. Good A has a flatter demand curve. The quantity change is bigger than the price change. And a price cut from the $20 to $15 increases total revenue from $1,000 to $1,800. Good B has a much steeper demand curve. The quantity change is smaller than the price change. And a price cut from $20 to $15 reduces total revenue from $1,600 to $1,350. So I warned you that in the last class that eventually I would attach a formula to elasticity, and here it is. Now, as it happens, there's a problem with calculating percent change. Let's go back to Beyonce's many replacement boyfriends uh, and assume that she starts the morning with seven possible replacement boyfriends, because that's how many are in this photo. But she has a bad hair day, and by afternoon, sadly, she is down to four potential boyfriends. So we calculate percent change by dividing the amount of the change, the delta, by the original number. That day, Beyonce has 43% quantity change in potential boyfriend replacements. In other words, a 43% decrease. 
So she begins the next morning with four possible boyfriends, but today her hair bounces around just the way it does on the video, and by that afternoon she has seven boyfriend replacements again. Her percent change in quantity, however, is now a 57% increase compared with yesterday's 43% decrease, except she's back where she started, right? Percent change is not commutative. You get different answers when you go in different directions because, of course, the denominator is different. Well, there's a way of solving this, at least for a linear equation that produces a nice straight line. You apply this averaging formula, which is in your textbook, which is incredibly time consuming. I had students calculate elasticity this way the first year I taught economics. The opportunity cost was too high. And what do I mean by that? I was giving up too much other material as we worked on getting all these numbers straight. So you're off the hook somewhat. When I ask you to apply the elasticity formula, I'm going to go ahead and give you a percent change, and we can all pretend that I applied the squirrely formula or calculated a first derivative. So here's an example. When the price goes up 20% or down 20%, the quantity goes down or up 10%. Now notice I just reversed those words. Price and quantity always move in opposite directions, right? In math speak, price and quantity are inversely related. So elasticity is always going to be a positive number divided by a negative number or vice versa. And thus it is always going to be negative. Now that I've told you that, I order you to forget it since I have seen this mess students up before. Elasticity is an absolute value problem. There are no negatives. It's all a matter of the order of magnitude. Have you wondered if you would ever use absolute value? The answer is yes, you use it here. But what really messes students up is that they forget that in this fraction formula, quantity always goes on top. In class, I had everybody repeat that. Quantity always goes on top. The reason this confuses students is that elasticity problems usually involve my giving you the price of change price change and asking you to tell me what the quantity change will be. That's how we are usually thinking about elasticity, right? How responsive are consumers to a change in price? Or actually, I should say, I'll give you the price and quantity change. But what I'll say is uh, the price changes 37% and the quantity changes 22% or something like that. And what is the elasticity? In other words, we're looking for responsive quantity to a change in price. Well, I was making that more complicated than it needed to. Let's add some numbers, which I think always makes it a little easier. So here's why remembering why we're using absolute value and remembering that Q always goes on top is important. All that this definition of elastic demand says is that the percent quantity change is larger than the percent price change. If the numerator is larger than the denominator, then the number you'll get is greater than one, right? And now we'll look at it for inelastic demand. All that this definition of elastic demand says is the percent, excuse me, of inelastic demand says is that the percent quantity change is smaller than the percent price change. If the numerator is smaller than the denominator, then the number you get is a decimal less than one, right? Demand is unitary if quantity goes up or down by the same percentages, and it makes for some delightfully easy math. So economists and the businesses that hire them uh, conduct a lot of empirical studies to try to figure out what consum consumer responsiveness to price. Here are some estimates they've come up with. Let me just tell you up front that these charts and graphs uh, are often going to come from the now ancient textbook you used for Unit 1 and that I used when I taught this in the classroom. I already have these slides on my computer to play with, so they're the slides I'm going to use. Sorry if it's sometimes confusing. The two books are really very similar, although they do present material in somewhat different order. So why would demand for fresh fish be elastic and demand for coffee inelastic for the average consumer? By the way, I chose the second line of the chart since I don't smoke, but I probably do have a chemical addiction to coffee. I love fresh fish too, but if I only have one dollar to spend, coffee is almost always going to win the marginal utils per dollar prize. And for that matter, if swordfish is too expensive, there's always farm-raised salmon or trout, although admittedly I could also give up on my Pete's coffee addiction and move to Folgers. So why does the phrase short run appear after gasoline? 
Well, in the short run, I'm probably stuck with the gas guzzler I already own or the house that's 25 minutes away on the freeway. If gas prices are going up and look like they're going to continue to go up, however, in the long run, I'm going to think about getting a Prius or a bike or a house near tracks. And in fact, uh, the oil producers of the OPEC cartel were very surprised at how much consumer response there actually was to an increase in gas price. It hurt their business more than they thought it would be. And the reason is that, cu that customers really did make changes in their behavior, again, in the long run with higher gas prices. It'll be interesting to see what happens now that oil and gas prices have, at least for now, come down. I think total revenue is actually an easier way of thinking about elasticity, and I talked that's why I talked about it first in class. But here's a slide that reviews the total revenue test for elasticity and adds a twist. Note that the, the good on the left is elastic at every point on the continuum. Every price reduction increases total revenue. But the good on the right is elastic between 50 cents and 45 cents and inelastic between 45 cents and 5 cents. That's often true in real life. Demand graphs usually aren't linear. The slope changes as the graph curves. This is just a graphical representation of total revenue using area. Uh, the area in each triangle, width times height, is the same as quantity times price, and therefore is equal to total revenue. This should be a review, except that uh, now we're adding in unitary elasticity. If a price change doesn't change total revenue, again, demand is unitary. It's as easy as that. You learn in the last class that sometimes sellers guess wrong about elasticity, or at least about how elastic or inelastic demand for a good really is. So New York tennis players have an inelastic demand for tennis court reservations, but not nearly as inelastic as the New York Parks and Recreation folks thought it would be. So here are some guidelines for determining elasticity of demand, or I should really say for estimating or guessing elasticity demand for a good. And I'm going to explain each of these in turn. If a good is a necessity, if I need insulin to avoid diabetic shock or coffee to face the morning without kicking one of my dogs, then I will give up other goods before I give up this necessity. This makes it more inelastic. My Lamborghini is not a necessity. And by the way, I don't have a Lamborghini. I check out the extra credit quizzes for a case study, the passage and repeal of a luxury tax on yachts. Basically, in a rush to tax the rich, Congress messed itself up by forgetting that luxury goods have a higher elasticity of demand. Uh, you'll also have a chance to explore the inter interesting question of who really pays a tax, something that the economists call tax incident, incidents, excuse me, another real life economics issue. So we already talked about this, right? If there are a lot of available substitutes, a good is not irreplaceable, to quote our uh, elasticity expert on uh, the music video. So elasticity of demand is higher. And again, no surprise, price elasticity is higher when the good will take a bigger chunk out of your income. Interesting example of this, during the Depression, demand for automobiles, as you might expect, dropped dramatically. Uh, basically, the demand curve shifted to the left because of a change in income. A little review of changes in demand. We'll go back to that. The movie business, on the other hand, boomed. Why? Well, it turns out that 10 cents, which is what a movie ticket usually cost back then, that bought a couple of hours away from worrying about how to meet the rent, you know, was really in addition to a person's utils. Uh, and since they couldn't afford a new car, it was nice to be able to go to the movies. Okay, our last practical application, and this is actually a really important one. Advertising is all about elasticity. So think about it. If you're a business, you'd like to be in a position where you can raise prices and still make more money, right? You do not want your consumers to be your customers to be price sensitive. You don't want them looking for substitutes. So advertising is about making a good more inelastic, about convincing you that some good is a necessity or that the other guy's detergent won't get my shirt so white so it's not an acceptable substitute. And with that, I'm going to stop and let you get on with some elasticity, elasticity practice problems.